Um, like Celeste mentioned, I'm going to be presenting my findings that I um, wrote up for my dissertation. Um, I'm in the final stages of, of that work, and I've learned a ton, um, and I've been able to apply a lot of my experience. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about myself and my educational journey, and then I'll get to um, some of the other things uh, that I think will be relevant to your practice and are also very connected to a lot of the things that were discussed yesterday and today um, after hearing Dr. Campbell speak. Um, and, and I hope you find some connections. Uh, and also, I hope I address an area that I feel like is not often talked about within the um, the practicum experience or within the credentialing experience. And so that was kind of the goal of the focus on my dissertation. And I'm going to share a little bit about that. Um, and so again, this is kind of just the roadmap for the talk. I'm not going to get that into the theoretical frameworks, but there is one theoretical framework and some connection to the literature that I find uh, is really relevant to my findings and themes that I was able to pull out of this study that I think will be beneficial across uh, UC and CSU credentialing programs. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All right. Um, so just a little bit about me. I've spent a lot of time at UC Davis. I got my credential and my master's uh, there. I taught in Davis Joint Unified School District. And then my current work um, that I've been doing for the past 10 years has been at Humboldt State University. And then most recently, as Celeste uh, mentioned, I'm in the Candell program, which I think uh, stands for Capital Area North doctorate in educational leadership. That, I think that's the acronym, but um, I can't say enough great things about this program. As you can see, there's a picture of uh, me with my cohort here right before the, the shutdown. Um, and it's really been a eye-opening experience for me as a scholar practitioner. And I just kind of wanted to um, uh, acknowledge the contributions of all these people who have been in my cohort um, who either work in the university, CSU, or community college system, and how they've really opened my eyes to um, equity issues that, that exist across um, our public educational systems. Um, there's also people who worked in, who work and have worked in K-12, and it was just really a great group. So if you're at all interested in, in joining a doctoral program, I can't say enough good things um, about that program and all the things that I've learned and the, and the growth that has resulted from that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just mention or remind us of, um, since we're in you know the second meeting of our second day, is really the the goal of this conference um, was presented to us as just building a professional community of supervisors across teacher education programs, with a priority being placed on actively engaging us in discussion and giving opportunities to share and ask questions. So I'm hoping that um, the way that I've set up this presentation will allow us to do a little bit of that um, and also to learn from each other. So whereas um, I'll be presenting some of the findings from, from my study, I think I have a lot to learn and I hope that there's a lot that you can contribute um, to this topic, which really is the relationship between resident teachers, mentor teachers, I, every university calls them something different, but the, the district um, uh, sponsor of the of the teacher candidate and the relationships that um, university supervisors have with that with that mentor. Um, and I think it's an often overlooked relationship. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can talk about how you as a supervisor center that relationship within the, the triad um, and also think about ways that your university program um, either currently does support uh, those relationships between the resident teacher and yourself and how maybe um, we could advocate for ourselves to uh, further develop those those connections, which I see as um, essential to the teacher candidate experience. Um, okay, so I'd like to uh, do a jam board. Um, I think, you know, now I said it's, uh, I'm going to copy the link address into the um, into the chat. 
And um, I wanted to thank Darlene Lee. I watched her presentation yesterday, and I actually ended up borrowing the template um, for, for this Jamboard. So if it looks familiar and you attended Darlene's, um, you'll, you'll notice the, the similarities probably. But if everyone could click on that Jamboard, um, I didn't know how many participants there were going to be. So what, did I, what I ended up doing is I made two slides. Um, but what I would like you to do here um, is just follow the prompt. Okay, so what I'd, I'm going to show you really quickly um, is I, I see a lot of similarities in the roles between university supervisors or how they're perceived and the roles. Uh, these are two doubles. And then the role of the resident teacher, also known as a mentor teacher or the, the district teacher. Um, so I'd like this to take a few minutes and just add, you know, how Jamboards work. You can include images, sticky notes, uh, text um, that just describe the role of the university supervisor and the resident teacher in these three um, stages of an observation uh, of a student teaching experience, right? So there's the planning phase there's the observation phase, and there's the debrief. So there's no right or wrong answers to this, but just kind of what do you think are some words or images um, or descriptions um, that these different dyad members play within um, the experience that we're describing here, which is the planning phase, the observation phase, and sort of the, the debrief phase of a, of a clinical um, observation experience. So let's take a few minutes to do that. Um, you'll see there's a lot of lot of ideas here to take a, a moment to just take them all in. Um, I like this one person who put um, this idea that maybe this template should look more like Olympic rings that are kind of interlocked within each other. Um, and, and sometimes they do get broken because of things like um, time constraints and, and the realities of um, trying to coordinate uh, three people together in one room, right? So within my study, that was um, often something that was shared is that, that there's never enough time to um, really uh, address some of the issues that that either the supervisor wants to address or the resident teacher wants to address um, for various reasons. So I, I always think that of that as, um, you know, when Dr. Campbell said, um, be radical with your with your use of time. I think, you know, part of what I was thinking about that really resonated that with me is I, I really do think that the role between the university teacher and the resident or cooperating teacher is an essential part of supporting this candidate through their journey, which was kind of the reason why, uh, one of the many reasons why I decided to, to focus my dissertation on this work. So um, you'll see also that um, the roles between um, supervisor and resident teacher are often similar um, in the ways that we use to describe them um, and different. So um, I, I like this one. This one's big and, and uh, it kind of stuck out to me together is this like idea of host. So the resident teacher is the person who is being kind enough to volunteer their time, share their space, and allow um, both the university and uh, the school, uh, the candidate, the teacher candidate, to be a part of um, their experience and to to host them as that. So I do think that this word host um, got used frequently in my in my research and this idea that we are borrow universities and teacher candidates are borrowing space and time from um, a resident teacher. And so um, I, I want to sit with with that idea for a while and kind of uh, think about what that means and how um, that can play out and and it kind of shows up in some of my findings as well. So um, I'm going to go back to my presentation. Thank you for participating in that. I, um, I wanted to get us thinking about kind of these roles and, and their similarities and differences. Um, and so, you know, you probably, I don't know, but in my experience yesterday, attending all the conferences um, or the 
the speakers, um, I don't remember it really being mentioned very often um, about the role of the resident teacher, right? So that's not the focus of this conference, but um, I do find it interesting that often when we talk about the university supervisor role, we're often thinking about the supports that they provide for the, the teacher candidate, who um, I, I usually consider the pre-service student teacher, but the the teacher candidate and the supervisor um, were really the theme that that I picked up on yesterday. And in speaking with my study participants, that was also the major focus of the conversations that both the resident teachers that I interviewed and the university supervisors um, wanted to center their practice on. So uh, all the all the questions that I asked about um, the supports that they provide for each other often got redirected towards the supports that they provide for their student teacher. And um, there's not a I'm not making a value judgment on that whether or not, but it is the primary focus of both the resident teacher and the university supervisors. And most of the studies that I read um, really had to do with the experience of the pre-service teacher and this idea that they're navigating um, and having difficulty in many cases, the complex worlds of the university and the school site. So um, as supervisors or maybe even former administrators, resident teachers, people who participate in teaching credentialing programs, um, you probably have noticed that most of the conversations I know that I have in my methods course and uh, my other courses that I teach center around this disconnect. So the university is telling me to teach these progressive teaching practices. Um, they want me to take risks. They want me to fight for equity. They want me to design my curriculum so um, that I'm uh, pushing, you know, uh, uh, the educational system forward. But but that sometimes is supported by the resident teacher and other times it is not. And the norms of the, the K-12 schools differ uh, and vary widely across um, the public school system. So the person who's sort of left navigating that is the, the pre-service teacher for better or for worse. And the person, the people that, that support them end up being both the resident teacher and the university supervisor. And many times uh, those two are not communicating with each other um, or uh, even when they have shared values, they're mostly using the pre-service teacher as sort of the go-between to make those communications with. Um, and so that's that's kind of what, what I found in a lot of the literature and I'll specifically talk about um, some themes in just a second. Um, these are the theoretical frameworks, you know, uh, uh, it was um, Dr. Nieves who was talking about, or I think maybe, sorry, I think it was Darlene that was talking, uh, Lee, who was talking about this idea of um, theory being sort of a compass or a way to frame the way that you think about it. And I'm not going to talk about the three that all three of them, but I think one that's interesting is this um, conceptions of teacher knowledge. And um, I, I challenge you to think about what which one of these um, fits the way either you or your university frames how teachers learn how to teach. So um, this, uh, this theoretical framework is broken into um, three different ways of thinking about how teachers learn how to teach. One is knowledge for practice. And knowledge for practice uh, makes the assumption that universities have a series of best practices and that they teach uh, student teachers, uh, pre-service teachers, how to, how to enact those. And then they get to practice those in the classroom. But the theoretical knowledge, the, the knowledge that they need to know to become teachers exists at the university level. And then, I think I found in my study, I did find that most supervisors and resident teachers, the, the ones that I spoke to, um, have a bit of a, a knowledge in practice uh, frame, which basically um, means that they that you learn how to teach by responding to the realities of your K-12 experiences. So the knowledge that you learn at the university level is great and, and you learn some of that, but where you really learn how to teach is by practicing it. And you practice that at the school level. And that's really the only way or, or the best way to learn how to teach. And then the authors here 
for this final one, or I guess kind of the goal of um, that we that that we do want to get to, and I'm not sure that um, I've been that necessarily the universities that I focused on or, or my university has quite reached this one is this idea of a of a knowledge of practice and a knowledge of practice assumes that there are three people who are collaborative partners so that would be the university supervisor the resident teacher and the student teacher and they co-construct knowledge and learning so that thematically really resonates I think with a lot of the things that the other speakers have talked about in terms of building equity acknowledging your own bias and privileges and then um, reinterpreting that in a way that we all have something to learn from this experience at the practicum and it's not just the responsibility of the pre-service teacher to learn all the things so um, I, that's a that's kind of the goal that we're going to trying to get to is this knowledge of practice and I felt like this one really resonated with the with the findings of um, my study and then I'm not going to talk uh, about these ones for the, the sake of time, but they exist here and in the notes there's more information about how they connected uh, to some of the work that I did. Um, I did want to talk a little bit more about the, the review of the literature for those who might be interested in doing more research on um, triad experiences within the practicum. So I think I mentioned there's kind of this like two worlds idea where um, student teachers are stuck navigating university learning and their K-12 experiences, um, and that's pretty well documented in li literature. I thought another interesting finding, and this isn't to bum all the supervisors out, but um, most researchers have found that there is a, a mimemic um, uh, which is common in pre-service teachers. So that meaning uh, it really matters on what the resident teacher is doing. And often um, for a variety of factors, the, the student teacher will end up uh, mirroring the, the mentor teacher or the resident teacher um, and uh, maybe not take the input of the supervisor as much because of the realities of acculturating into the K-12 system in which they're trying to participate in. And to me, that really resonates with my experience and, and, and makes sense. Um, but I think that makes a, a strong case for why we need to sort of um, include our resident teachers in the process of, um, of collaborating with us and the ideas or the um, equity-based practices uh, that we're trying to enact at the university level um, or within our supervision. Um, the, other, the other one that I thought was particularly interesting, and then I'll, I'll move on to my findings, um, is that the there's there's an idea of the multiple worlds pitfall and um, the multiple worlds pitfall is this idea that um, student teachers are influenced by the resident teachers beliefs and institutional practices also the school culture and then uh, student teacher prior educational experience so what they come with us already have knowing and then also student responses during classroom instruction so once they're in the classroom doing their student teaching the way students are responding to their curriculum is going to influence the learning experience that our student teachers have so there's a lot that we we don't have control over but I would um, argue and I think my findings suggest that um, if we can find ways to further collaborate with resident teachers, we will have um, more opportunities to make a greater impact with our teacher candidates. Um, so the findings of my uh, study, and I'm getting, this is my second to last slide, and then we'll, we'll do a little bit of discussion here. Um, I interviewed uh, five university supervisors and eight resident teachers, and it was a qualitative study. Um, I was unable to recruit any um, tenure track faculty members, which I think is interesting to point out because um, the those that I spoke to were adjunct faculty uh, in, in terms of the supervisors. They had a lot of uh, an amazing amount of um, K-12 teaching experience, and uh, the resident teachers I also spoke to were equally inspired. Inspiring. So the, the participants in my study were, were very dedicated to their practice, um, and they were really making use of um, all the resources they had to support these pre-service teachers. Um, keeping that in mind, though, I definitely saw that theme that I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk uh, discussion was that the 
one thing that remains constant through all of the participants that I spoke to is there really is a didactic relationship with the pre-service teacher. So by that, I mean the supervisor is communicating with the student teacher and the student teacher is communicating with the resident teacher, but communications between the resident teacher and the supervisor were few and far between for a variety of reasons, but it was really the, the student teacher who was the center of the, um, of the input and they were kind of brokering these um, these relationships and, and they were definitely the center of support there. And then another sort of interesting um, theme that that I found was um, I, I termed it protective mentoring, which was the when the supervisor would come in to evaluate the the student teacher, some of the resident teachers would describe it as like game day. And so they would they would want to make sure that their student teacher was as prepared as possible and so that they could showcase their best work to their supervisor. And so that everyone and, and vice versa, the findings were similar in that the supervisor would sometimes uh, look to the, the student teacher to get cues about the relationship that they were having with um, the the mentor teacher to make sure that they were getting treated correctly, that they were being um, welcomed into the classroom. And so there was a bit of um, protective mentoring on both sides. And um, and and that arise uh, I think that arises from um, a concern for this didactic relationship with these pre-service teachers. Um, another one that uh, I found in the study was that there's this kind of assumption of student teacher self advocacy. So, um, especially related to some of the resident teachers. So, this idea that it's their program, it's their homework, it's their, their credential year, and they're going to get out of it what they put into it. And so, ultimately, it's their responsibility to communicate what they're comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with, what they what they need, um, what they need from the experience. And um, I think that's interesting when you think about uh, the other findings, right? So there's these themes don't necessarily um, connect to each other, but they are themes that are um, that all center around the student teaching experience. And then finally, this this idea of um, mentoring and isolation, which is um, this idea that there are a lot of, um, I think, missed opportunities for collaboration between the resident teacher and the and the supervisor, and I think uh, a lot of that results in lack of time, lack of resources, and I and I really do think it's the university's responsibility to facilitate those sorts of of relationships. The one. Um, relationship opportunity that was shared by some of my participants was a um, sort of a, a thank you breakfast for the resident teachers in which they invited the resident teachers to come to campus um, and they got uh, the student teachers to take over their classrooms so that they could all either be on Zoom during COVID or sit in the same room and talk about common experiences that they have with mentoring and that they have with um, supervision and, and working together to try and build relationships over time. So the, the rest of our time together, I'd like to kind of talk about uh, these in our breakout room. So thinking about um, your own university program and thinking about how the role expectations between resident teacher and university supervisor are communicated to you by your university program and how these might be similar or different from how you interpret your role as a supervisor. I think um, one of the things that I shared is there's a wide variety of supervision strategies that are used uh, across um, both my program and the, the program that I studied. And I, I find that very interesting that, that people kind of find their own way and they find their own path. And that was kind of reconfirmed by the discussions and the, the talks that I've attended uh, yesterday and today. Um, and then in what ways does your university or could your university um, advocate and support uh, a more collaborative experience between your resident teachers and, and you as supervisors? And um, I think that's, uh, if you want to, when you're in your breakout rooms, contribute to the Jamboard. It says slide three, but it's, the, it's obviously the last board. And then um, those who were uh, said they couldn't 
go could use the use a second Jamboard as well. So I just met with my Humboldt State uh, folks and we had a great discussion about our our, our program and how we um, do support our, our resident teachers and our um, supervisors and how we could potentially make some improvement. So um, my hope is that you, you did the same as well. Um, we don't have very much time, but I don't know if anybody had follow-up questions or anything that they wanted to uh, address related to the talk. I will uh, hold back and um, answer or address those now. And if the rest of you need to go on to your next talk, thanks for coming. Uh, yes, Dr. Allison Black. Is it Black something? Yeah, that's it. Thank yes. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I found this talk really fascinating and, and useful. Thank you. I was curious about um, like the term disconnect kept coming up. And in and I was just sort of thinking about it because this has always come up for us in our practice too. And I, I don't know, now that I feel like I'm in my I'm in my fifth year now and maybe going into my sixth, I'm not sure I have to do some math, but I'm thinking, you know, is it really a disconnect or is it a reality that we just need to state up front and address and work through? You know, I don't know. It's something that that I've been thinking about as you were talking. And I yeah, you know, one of the really I thought really poignant things, um, Amy from our HSU group mentioned, she said, you know, in my experience, when I became a teacher, I did go through that disconnect where I was like, okay, I'm learning all this stuff at the university level, but I'm not able to apply it right now for a ver variety of reasons. I need to find a job. I need to, you know, not drown, you know, and, and figure out how to, how to do my job. And she's like, it was then that I returned to my university curriculum. And I thought, how can I apply the things I at, learned at the university level to my practice? So perhaps a follow-up to this study would be, you know, what if I talk to pre-service teachers, uh, or sorry, now teachers, um, who had attended university programs and asked them about how they apply what their supervisor uh, taught them or equity-based practices that the university was reinforcing that maybe at the time um, they didn't feel like they were able to enact because they were uh, a guest in someone else's classroom. They were at a school that maybe wasn't as supportive of that or, or something. Maybe they needed to build confidence or sounds like, yes, resilience, that, that maybe it took some confidence building in my ability to do the technical aspects of the classroom, like, you know, manage a bunch of kids or, you know, get positive praise from an administrator and maintain my job, get tenure. So I, I think that, I think you're talking about a similar thing. Great point, thank you. I am going to interject here. It is now time for us all to give Heather a great big thank you for her presentation today. Heather, we're so grateful that you shared your research and findings with us and led us in this really wonderful discussion that we had a chance to do today with that. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming.